should start here in a second. Welcome to Bon Jovi Discussions. Today, again, I have my buddy Michael. Uh, we just did part one of talking about the evolution of Bon Jovi. We talked about the 80s. We talked about the 90s. And now we're going to talk about 2000 to right now. So, so let's dive in. So as in the previous episode, I kind of mentioned about how Bon Jovi started to come together again in 1998 um, to start recording songs for what was called at the time Sex Cells. There's also a few different titles, but what we know, it, it became Crush in 2000. And the album was actually supposed to come out in 1999 because in the single that they did for NTV, Real Life, Real Life. in the beginning it says Bon Jovi, Sex Cells, out summer 1999 i think yeah. and then john started to write more songs and like those songs better than what they had written and recorded for crush and so kind of scrapped some songs and then obviously crush came out in 2000 and this is such you know we talked about the band going into the 90s with a new sound new vision and all that but they also did that for 2000 and i think this is so important because 2000 was obviously you know, 1992 was when the grunge was popular, but 2000 was when pop music was popular. Stuff like Britney and Backstreet Boys, NSYNC, and all those, all that stuff. And so the band had to, okay, how do we enter a new era, stay true to ourselves, be successful, but still keep with yep. our vision and, and still be popular? And so they brought in Luke Evans, who uh, recorded Bounce and or Crush and Bounce, and is truly my favorite producer of the band that they've ever worked with. Um, but with Crush, you know, the first single was It's My Life. And man, what a smash single that that was for the band. You know, and it had that pop. I love pop rock Bon Jovi. That's my favorite yeah, type of Bon Jovi sound. And with It's My Life, I don't know if a lot of people know this, it was co-written. This is how great John and Richie were with Evolving. It was co-written with Max Martin, who wrote in sing songs, wrote Backstreet songs. So yeah. they like kind of had their eyes, you know, yeah. eyes open, like, okay, this is what's going on. And yeah. it's weird because even if you think of those boy band songs, lyrically they're 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 pretty well written. You know, I know some oh. people are in some who aren't fans or whatever the case is, you know, no. There boy, is this nothing that. wrong with <laughs> the the nineties pop. There's nothing wrong. I I I thrived on the, that stuff when I was a kid. And you get someone like Max Morton who wrote, like it's gonna be me and all those songs. And John just I just I think him just being honestly smarter than most people is kind of like, son of a. There we go. That's we're gonna get that guy to come in and you know write with us. See if it, the styles work, obviously, and you know had living on a prayer number two essentially with it's my life because that was the that top kept, box. that yep that kept their sounds and just popular where it wasn't pop like you know you're gonna choreograph dance to it, but it it had a fresh sound to it which was. It worked for them, and it worked for everybody else, so. Yep, exactly. And um, that was a perfect, because that created a new generation of fans. I'm proof of that, because I became a fan. I was eight years old in May of 2000, watching music. I was actually waiting for music videos from, like, Backstreet and, and stuff like that. And, uh, and all of a sudden, it's, it's My Life came on. I'm like, who's this? And, I, you know, the, the, you know, Tommy in the videos type in, and, you know, and then it just mm -hmm. shows him, you know, trying to get to see Bon Jovi. In, in his town, Los Angeles. Well, I guess it's more than a town. But, uh, and, that's like, and then they showed the band of the video. I'm like, man, these guys look so freaking cool. And, like, this guy is so dedicated to his favorite band. And, like, just the song was catchy enough. Mm -hmm. And every day, you know, this is before the internet days, which we're going to get into that here in a second, too. Every day, I'd get, I'd, I'd sit in front of VH1 or MTV and wait for that video to come on. And then, obviously, Crush came out in June. And that's what started it all for me. But before, I want to talk about the internet. So internet was started to become a thing in 2000. And so obviously in the video too, they show the kind of like the live stream. You yep. know, not as we know it today, you know, now like, like this is clear. 
But back yeah. then, it was very wonky and stuff. And it coming, I don't know if you – did you ever go on – oh, you became a fan in 2003. So in 2000, they started to, to develop BonJovi.com. And let me tell you, it would – it would work one day, but it wouldn't work the next day. And like to play I videos, forget that. about it. it. It would have to buffer for a while. And then you'd get to watch like a minute of it and then free. Oh, man. But BJTV was also a thing, too, because they recorded um, recordings of them in the studio recording Crush in Sanctuary Studios 2 in John's house in Red Bank. And uh, that was pretty good. They did that for Bounce, too. Um, but yeah, so that was kind of cool. Yeah, the way they, um, I, I remember when I, I was six, seven, I was being after school after the program, and I'd be on in the computer lab typing up, <laughs> going, trying to watch your music videos and stuff, and you could only watch 30 seconds at a time. Yeah. You had a, um, you had to either subscribe to it or whatever the case was, you couldn't watch the music videos fully, and I would get in trouble in school because the teacher would walk by and they would be like, they would just see Bon Jovi and, and think 80s, sex, drugs, rock and roll. Like, why are you seven? Why are you watching this right now? Mm-hmm. And it, that, I, the old format of the website was, some, I, I remember it vaguely because I, I was I was young, but that was, you, you can only hear 30 seconds of a music video. That's all I remember. Yeah, it was, it was quite the time. Um, yeah, so you know the band went into the Crush tour. That was a successful tour. You know they did about a year in the states and overseas, and then we'll get into the next one, One Wild Night, which was a the tour was a continuation of the Crush tour. Yeah, but it was also the band's first compilation because in 1990 the band the band had recorded. I hope we get this someday. The band had recorded a lot of the New Jersey tour because they were going to do a, a double live album. Because they didn't get to yeah. do a double CD for New Jersey. And the record company was like, no, bands aren't doing this right now. You don't want to do that. Then fast forward, Guns N' Roses does Use Your Illusion. And I'm yeah. like, guys, you should have freaking released that. But anyway, so we got our first live compilation, One Wild Night. And it had stuff from the debut tour, 700. Uh, it, what my regrets, though, is it, or it should be the band's regret. Um, they didn't put anything out with Slippery. They didn't put anything out from Jersey Tour. They didn't put anything out from the Keep the Faith Tour. They like met, They like skipped '86 to '94. They skipped that like eight years, and I'm like, there's so many incredible performances that I they can miss. Always of ninety of Wembley in '95. Yeah, you know. So I I wonder what ju- the band's justification was for that. But still, it was still a great live album. You know, we get, I think It's My Life, Prayer, Bad Name was from Zurich, Switzerland in 2000. Keep the Faith as well. Saturday Night, I think, was... Well, I, I think... Uh, they had, they threw Rockin' in the Free World on yeah. that album, which I loved. I Don't Like Mondays. Uh, yeah, the um, yeah. Bad Medicine was in... It was the same version as it is on the Crush Tour DVD yeah. in Zurich. Yeah. In and out of loves from 85. I wish they would have put a live version of One Wild Night on there, though, instead of the remix version. Yeah. You know, because that was the, that was fun live, you know? Yeah, that, that song was fun. Uh, and I, I really like that they put something to believe in on there as well. They also, they could have, and the end, their most underrated song, in my opinion, they have just older on there. Yeah, and that that song is. I was I was so happy they brought it back on the tour last year, and but yeah. they like they hit it for ten years. I don't know where it went, but it it, it was definitely awesome that they have um, the live sound of it on the CD. Yeah, I I love that. Um, and uh, let's get into bounce. So so the band. Um, John and Richie were starting to write some songs that I think actually became B-sides and outtakes. But John and Richie were in their John's house in Red Bank, New Jersey. And then obviously the 9-11 attack happened one day. Yeah. John was already up watching the news and woke up Richie. And they started to write stuff, you know, undivided. A lot of people think that Balance was like a full-on dedicated album to 9-11. It actually wasn't. The only songs mm-hmm. that actually... No, not at all. The only songs that were actually written about 9-11 were Undivided, Every Day, and Bounce. Just those three songs. 
But I also think in a way too, it kind of led to a lot of different kind of lyrics of you know, resiliency, you know, confident bouncing back. And that's yeah. what the title of Bounce means is bouncing back from that tragedy. And uh, it Bounce is such a phenomenal, underrated album. You ask any diehard Bon Jovi fan, what do you think is the most underrated album from the band? Some will say these days, but Bounce is definitely more underrated. It's and it's a shame John doesn't want to do any of those songs live anymore. Yeah, well, Bounce, it. I I definitely I like certain songs on it. I don't like because. In a way, to me, it feels like some some way like a continuation of Crush, because I think it's just like it's tough because it's like Crush had "Thank You for Loving Me," Bounce has "All About Loving You," and it was like it was similar in that ways. But yeah. there is songs that um. But see, I love that. I love. See, I, I, yeah. I, I, I not to interrupt you here, but like I'm a guy of I don't like change. I just like yeah. I, so I was I'm okay. You know, and Luke Evans was also the same producer. Mm-hmm. Or Palace, the same as Crush. So, but I, I don't want to interrupt you anymore. Keep going. And Dad, and like my favorite song on that album is Right Side or Wrong and Joey. Those two songs are Right Side or Wrong. I, I think on it, the way I view it, it, it was like John's head about wanting to be in the Sopranos because how he, Stevie Van Zandt got asked to be on it and he called David Chase and it just. That he told him he was too recognizable from being from Jersey, so it wouldn't work. And because the way right side or wrong is, it kind of sounds like two dudes that just took care of something. And they're trying to flee and you know making ends meet for their families mm-hmm. and um, doing, even though it's wrong, like slipping sweat socks into your shirt, like stealing, like he's doing what he has to do for his family. Yeah, and even I know there's a lot of comparisons between Joey and the Elton John song, Leave On, where it's kind of like they just took it. Hey, just take it. Jo- Joey is, I wished he would play that song. <laughs> I love that song. Well, that's the great thing about Runaway Tours, too, is that he will do songs that we never yeah. Yeah. So Joey is one of those heavily played ones. And John has been very vocal lately about how much he loves Right Side of Wrong. But you know what I think is the best song? When they would do the JBG. <clears throat> when they did the JBG, JBJ um, experience thing, and he's watching the solos with Richie and that solo he does with Right Side Wrong, you could see just his mannerisms. He's like in his feels with that song. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, but I think the, the greatest song on Balance is Love Me Back to Life. Interesting. Yeah. I, I, I like that song. It doesn't do much for me. I, I, I don't, it doesn't do much no. for anybody, but I love it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it makes it feel it, like what's more of mine, you know. The no song bounce. So. The song bounce is actually um, dedicated to Bill Belichick, believe it or not. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Because yeah. the way he was ran out of here with with the Jets coaching job and like how all that controversy. I yeah. I forgot that was a thing. Honestly, I forgot about it too. Um, so the other night. So let's get into the next was on the bounce. They did the bounce tour, and it was, bounce wasn't as successful as crush. I think bounce was just kind of overshadowed with crush and one one night, and then they were kind of like yeah. bounce is kind of sprung on pretty quick uh, in two thousand two, I think. But um, but the, so the next project two thousand three was the band one or the record company I think wanted John to do another. Um, either a box or greatest hits or a box set. And so they were actually working on the box set. And John wrote Thief of Hearts, uh, Last Man Standing, the box set version that we know. Yeah. And that was actually going to start the album. And then John's like, you know, I want to save these for the box set. And I think actually, yeah, Thief of Hearts was actually supposed to go on. This stuff feels right. But then John's like, you know what? Let's do a greatest because the box set was going to take some more time. So like in the meantime, let's release a greatest hits, but with a twist, and all all their hit songs acoustic. And this album gets a lot of hate. I personally love it. I think it's one of the greatest band projects that they've ever done. And for me, it kind of like like you said with like Living in Sand, it kind of helped you understand your parents' divorce. I was. 
11 years old. My parents were divorcing that year, 2003. And I, I, we were moving far away from where I lived. You know, I was trying to, you know, I wanted to live with my dad, you know, or who I wanted to live with, basically. Um, and so that album for me as an 11-year-old kid really helped me because they had something that, something new, fresh, and something I really connected with just because I needed something to get through what I was going through with my parents' divorce. So maybe that's why I love the album so much. Mm-hmm. But it's one of those albums that you could just relax to, have a glass of wine, and just kind of... It's a different atmosphere of Bon Jovi. I think it's more intimate, more inclusive. And I posted on Twitter the other day, I don't know if you saw it, but I posted, unpopular opinion, this left the field right version. Wanted, the wanted version on that album is actually better than Slippery. And I'll stand alone on that. I will. <laughs> it has more of an edge to it, I think. But reg- regardless, it's a fantastic album. I love the way that they, you know, reworked it and redid it for the um, this Left Feels Right album. It was because it was especially the, right um, when you got to the bridge of the song. The way I view how he's like saying it, he's like looking back and almost like with a grin on his face, like same old me, same old band, and he's just kind of like, yeah, we did that, and here and he kept that song he he like and he brought it another life essentially because that not the original song that we all know and love got more headway because of it when it came to stuff like american idol and like rock band and all that stuff that song kind of like gave um more like probably a little bit younger my generation a little bit younger um yeah. of like their maybe their first hint of it Hey, we say our generation. I'm <laughs> five years older, but our generation. <laughs> Not old, just just older. Don't make me feel old here. Um, so, yeah, so this left, you know, obviously there wasn't really much to do with it. They, they did a live concert in Atlantic City, which I thought was great. Um, and then 2004, you know, I want to back up to it because I just want to say 2000 to 2000 and eight even you know even just the first 10 years 2000 to 2010 or 11 was such a great time for the band because or even as becoming a family every year there was something coming out whether it was an album compilation or a tour the band was always doing something and but anyway, so let me go back to 2004 so we got our first box set 100 million bon jovi fans can't be wrong which was the celebration of and i think this this might have been also a reason too why they kind of held back on releasing this because the bounce era 2002 2003 they had only sold 80 to 95,000 million albums so i wonder did they take that extra year to meet the 100 million milestone yeah. and kind of replicate elvis's um version yeah. of that and exactly so like that, <laughs> that box that is every diehard's dream to have it, you know, it's full of gems of outtakes and demos and photos and a very a concert staple came off of that box set um, radio. Oh Especially yeah, the, the late two thousands. I was always being circled yeah. into the set list. There's a Garage lot. Land. Um, There's a lot of songs on that on that, was, that box set that you you wonder how did this not make the album? You know. Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, like when you say my life should have been on Keep the Faith, Starting All Over Again should have been on Keep the Faith, Breathe should have been on Bounce. I think Garage Land was Keep the Faith. Right, yep, Garage Land was Keep the Faith. Um, Why aren't you dead? I don't know where that was supposed to be, honestly. Keep I the, love that song. Keep the no, Faith. That the was faith. actually going to be the first single for Keep the Faith, believe it or not. Interesting. For- John said that in like a 93 interview. I, I think it was maybe not the first thing, but it was definitely the first batch of songs. And mm-hmm. John thought it was too tongue in cheek for it was like kind of like bad name. And he didn't want to be known for that again. He wanted to be yeah. known for like a different director like Keep the Faith was. Um, but yeah, then you know, we got the DVD of the band talking about these songs and stuff. Mm-hmm. And, and then so then 2005, Have a Nice Day comes out. And uh, that was a really fun time for the band, too, because we got 
I remember I was so excited because I fell in love with Last Man Standing, the box set version. Yeah. It was also on the This Left Feels Right concert in 2003. And then I remember Have a Nice Day was the first single. And uh, we, we saw the music video premiere on TV. And then before the album came out, so, you know, we're still in internet days, but we're pre internet days where you didn't get to yeah. hear the album before the release. So the only song that you ever got to hear from Have a Nice Day was Have a Nice Day. And then I remember like a week before the release, if you signed up for bonjovi.com, you got to hear uh, Last Man Standing. I was like, okay. And so I went, and I remember it was like so different. I was like, what is this? And uh, it, <laughs> it was, we recorded. Um, but Have a Nice Day was really a great album. You know, uh, there was songs about divorce on there, co- you know, confidence, resiliency. Um, you know, kind of like what Have a Nice Day is like, you know, most people think, oh, hey, have a nice day. No, it was more have a nice day, you know, with that, you know. Yeah, exactly. That's what it nice was. Day. And, um, you know, so that was the kind of the tone of the album. You know, there's a lot of gems on there that are underrated that don't get any light of day. You know, I am. Um, I am is. I am is such a great song. That was. That's my problem. That and Welcome to Wherever You Are is my favorite on that album. Specifically, because that, that was the year my parents divorced. And that was the perfect, yeah. you know, like album for that kind of stuff and musically it brought back their like kind of bounce was a rock record but it it let them know that like we're we're still here to like kick ass kind of exactly you know welcome to our VR really helped me you know because i was geez how i was 13 14 years old so i was you know becoming a teenager and you know at that age you're, you're starting to become independent and stuff and trying to fit into society and I wasn't the most popular kid, you know, and I had bullies and stuff. But, and so that song made me feel like, you know what, I do matter. Um, mm-hmm. Also, I did the same thing for me, too, as a kid. You know, it made me feel like, okay, I matter. My voice matters. And I may not fit in, but I still have, I still matter. Um, you know, and my favorite outtake of all time is from this album, Nothing. I love that song. What song was it? I didn't hear you. I'm sorry. Nothing. Okay. Yeah, I know. I know exactly what you're talking about. And if you put "I am" and "nothing" back to back, it's actually almost the same instrumentally. Which yeah, is- it's very. It's. I mean, it's probably a, a quarter or two off here and there, but it's very. Yeah. Dude, there were so many underrated songs on an album that Novocaine, "Complicated." They, they. I. Lee wish he not that it would ever happen. He would play that album start to finish because oh yeah, so many hidden gems that it's just because obviously who says you can't go home and come to Jennifer Nettles versions? But you know me, you know stole the um stole the show on that album. Oh right, no. I mean, and what I love about who says you can't go home? So that was originally recorded with Keith Urban. Yep, I've and heard that. Just, Come on. That their voice has blended too much. So John found Jennifer Nettles, who was at the time really popular with Sugarland. And I remember going to school and I'd get bullied about Bon Jovi and blah blah blah. And they, they, you know, my bullies would say, Oh, they're just the 80s, has been, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, no, they're not. And then all of a sudden, who says you can't go home? Just blew. So my area that I, I live in a very country-esque area where it's a lot of country people. And so country music is obviously the most listened to. And so when Who Says You Can't Go Home just blew up. And as we know, it became Bon Jovi was the first rock band to have a number one country yep. single. Who Says You Can't Go Home just blew up. And I went to school the next day after I hit number one. <laughs> I puff up my chest, my Bon Jovi shirt on. I go, my band is on your country station number one right now. Being <laughs> all of your country artists, you know. And I remember on my school bus, People would be singing along to "Who Says You Can't Go Home," and it was just everywhere. That song, you know, it was everywhere. It was. He even got um. He. That was the song for the preview to um the MLB playoffs when it would give the thirty second commercials and like October's coming. That was the song playing in the background, and then eventually it got changed to "I Love This Town," 
when Boss Hog Week yeah. came out. That was Have right. a nice yeah. day. That was that was the first. That was the first tour I saw. It was the first concert I saw at oh, Giant Stadium good. in 06. Nice. And it poured. Hey, that's okay. <laughs> I that's love rain shows. Let's get into Lost Highway. So obviously, with Who Says You Can't Go Home, the success of that, um, it influenced John to do a country album. And I remember as a fan, this was before you heard You Want to Make a Memory. I think in early 2007, John had said in an interview, yeah, we're doing a new album. We're in Nashville. And it's actually going to be a country-influenced album. Mm -hmm. and at this time, there was MySpace. And I think the backstage fan club forums were around. And I remember everybody was just, and I was into the fandom at the time too, and everyone was just like, "Flip! I, I don't want a country album, blah blah blah." And like I was even worried too. I was like, "You know, what? I'm not a big country fan. I'm like, I don't really want a country album." And the key word that we had to remember at the time was country influence. Mm -hmm. So as John has said, rock and country are pretty much similar. Country just has more of a twang and banjo and and one's in and one's not. Yeah. And uh, so I remember in March 2007, uh, they were premiering um, You Want to Make a Memory on an award show. And I remember I had recorded on VHS tape. This is before DVR days and all that. And I was so blown away by Make a Memory that I replayed it so much. And I absolutely just, and it's obviously my favorite song. And uh, I was like, okay, I, I could probably get behind this Lost Highway album now. And I don't think they even announced the title of the album yet. I think we were still waiting mm -hmm. to see what the title was. And it was eventually released later on. And uh, but then Lost Highway came out in June. And I remember getting the album, waking up that early on, watching Make a Memory hit number one, and going to Kmart to buy the Lost Highway album and the DVD concert. And I remember I went home. And it's such a great summer album because I went home, went outside, put it on my boom box, and just played it nonstop. I even shoved it down my dad's throat, my brother's throat, and I said, you guys got this. It's such a fantastic record. And it, it there's not it, – it, it's essentially a Bon Jovi rock album with some country in there. And I think the songwriting is more country-influenced. The, so, the songwriting's – more country influence compared to I think what everybody feared that it was going to be like, you know, twanged up and all banjo this and that. Because it was no nowhere near that at all. Yeah. But that album, I mean, that's Lost Highway is my favorite album, and it it's has so many. I could talk forever about each song on the album, specifically yeah. songs like. The last night, he next to you. I love this town. Yeah. They and it was it was so great because it was it was another, in my opinion, another ele um, evolution <laughs> band the because they like I, like you know we said in the beginning like how we you know just said before with um, the boy with the boy band stuff, country was very popular. It still is very popular, but it was coming strong in the mid to late two thousands. Saw it with Who Says You Can't Go Home, took that, like, you know, recipe, didn't change, you know, their complete approach, and they just twanged it up a little bit. And that album, I mean, that Lost Highway tour was, I think, a whole year, year and a half of touring. They went all, oh, and it's just started. It was supposed to be 10 nights in Jersey. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in November 2007, they did 10 nights. And then from January, or I feel when the tour actually started in January, but it ended in July. So it was actually mm -hmm. just a pretty short tour, but they did a lot in that, in those six. They went all over the world. They went to Japan. They went to Europe. They went, they were over here, obviously. They they went all over the place. And, and Any Other Day is the best song live on that album. The way they do that outro, forget it. Yeah. Um, but, you know, we kind of talked about this in the first episode when we were doing our, our favorite album. What, what I love about Lost Highway is that it is so it has different tastes of moods. You know, you have your songs like Lost Highway, Summertime, We Got It Going On, where it's, you put it in your car radio, mm -hmm. go on and drive with your windows down and just, you know, fist pump in and having a good time. Then you also have songs that are about love and stuff. Then you have songs about loss, you know, because Richie was going through um, his divorce. divorce. 
And a lot of people think that it was also about Richie's dad, but it really wasn't because Richie's dad had kind of passed after the recording. Um, mm. I think Seat Next to You was like one of the last songs recorded, and that would had some some a little bit yeah. of with Richie's dad. But um, so you have a lot of songs that are also about feeling alone and and isolating. You know, songs like The Last Night, Everybody's Broken. You know, I, those were fantastic songs. Lost Highway also holds a special place in my heart too because it was the last album that the band released that my dad was alive during. So every album, you know, my dad would always take me to the store to get the album, would always listen to it with me, and then would take me to see a show. And that was the last album and tour that I got to share with my dad. And uh, surprisingly, when my dad died, all of those songs I really held near, like Seat Next to You and my dad died. I played that song. He died in 2009. But I played Seat Next to You over and over and over because I really thought of him during that song. Yeah, see, see next to you, and that, that's a great point. How each there's probably two or three songs broken up on that album, where you have like Lost Highway, We Got It Going On, where it's there's those are great feel good songs, and and you could put Summertime in that as well, and then you have the songs like Whole Lot of Leaving, Seat Next to You, Everybody's Broken. They all have like their own categories on a twelve um, song album, which is amazing that all emotions are piled into that song positive negative you know moving on loss everything is there for the taking and yeah. man they they killed it per usual i i love watching the lost highway the concert the um the um sound checks oh yeah yep because just seeing how they you had it not that they had to change, they had to work out, you know, because obviously the violinist was there, all these kind of kinks. Yeah. <laughs> to see, you know, how are we going to do this? How are we going to, you know, transition from this song to that song? How's this, you know, and it's just showing it, you know, just showing them at work and killing yeah. it for, as usual. Yeah. And I think Lost Head was, was, was kind of like a, st- a new step for the band, too, as far as. We're becoming an older band here, but we're still relevant. We're still being successful. They had the number one tour for Lost Highway. And so you saw a more mature Bon Jovi. Mm-hmm. Also become a, like, this is my mom's favorite band, but now this is my favorite band kind of yeah. thing. Uh, so let's get into the circle. So 2009, um, the band had started to um, do a documentary, which some of it was yeah. the Lost Highway tour, uh, when we were beautiful, and pointed at them poster i have back there um yeah. and then they also put a book out with it and uh the circle came out in november 2000 as well as the book in november 2009 um which was great because my dad died in august of 2009 and kind of like how this life feels right was with my parents divorce mm-hmm. the circle gave me something to look forward to and kind of connect with and i remember listening to the circle for the first time the first day and there was that live before you die message yeah and I really connected with that song, and it, it, in a way, it kind of saved me in a way. Um, but the, the circle is, I think, the circle is a great album. It was also the start of John becoming more. Pol- I know he says he's not political. I know, yeah, it, it's political. Okay, yeah, still good songs, but it was definitely heavily socially conscious political. And, but there's really good songs on there, like uh, We Weren't Born to Follow, um, Superman, Thorn in My Side, Live Before You Die. But uh, Work for the Working Man. I remember John did a live performance of Work for the Working Man in summer of 2009, even before there was a We Weren't Born to Follow single, which came out in August. It was like midsummer, and John had played it at a John Bon Jovi and Friends show. And it was so much different than uh, what we got in the circle. And I actually like that a lot better. But it, it, it's hard for me to listen to work for the working man you know, because it's kind of contradictory because it's about the working man trying to make ends meet. But then the, the ticket prices for that tour were just insane. That's like the start of insane ticket prices. Yeah. The album, like, it's not my favorite by any means. It was definitely, I feel like when we were beautiful, 
Love's the Only Rule. Those are my songs on the album. Yeah. And I was too, I was in eighth grade when that album came out. So I didn't understand really the political side of it, you know, crazily. Obviously, I, I kind of know, I know what it's about now. But yeah. it wasn't, work for a working man, it, what I do have to say about it is, if you're Republican or Democrat, it hit both sides in, in that way where he was, like, it, it definitely showed, like, you know, this man's, you know, busting his ass and he can't afford this for his family. Yeah. But then, like, everything else, it's like, well, yeah, because everything in the world's expensive right now. And he was, I think he was just trying to get that message to people to not be against each other, to try and push through this as much as we can, because the whole... 2009 financial crisis i don't love when he goes political but i definitely understand it i, de- I definitely get it but you know that that <laughs> album i think especially in today's world it took the politically conscious way took away from you know great songs like when we were beautiful and superman and love's the only rule but yeah that tour was i saw that i saw that show twice on that tour and that show was killer i was at, i was at the show where he, he tore his calf muscle actually do, doing glad all over it as an encore what that, that show say, definitely stood up what i'll say is the 2010 circle tour and 2011 tour which is a continuation of the circle tour yeah. was the best tour that they've ever done best set list best mm-hmm. change up everything everything was and you never knew what kind of rarities you were going to get and they were doing encore after encore long shows it was just a great two years for the band. Let's get into 2010 real quick. I have a theory with that. The reason they were doing that is because they, I think at that point they got denied twice to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and the chip was on his shoulder to, you know, with those long three hour concerts he put on like that, you know, where yeah. we belong there. He always said it didn't bother him, it didn't bother him. The bullshit. Like, of yeah, course okay. it did. Uh, but 2010, they were, uh, they released a box set another compilation um, because the circle, I think it was actually supposed to come out after the compilation, but John wanted to re- release the circle with the, when we were beautiful documentary. And so anyway, so the 2010 box that you got a standard desk and you got two discs yeah. and each disc got two new songs. So the first disc had, what do you got? And then no apology. The second disc had, this is love. This is life, which is actually originally called this ain't love. This is life. I think this is life. And then the more things change, and those were all circle outtakes. I think more things change was a new song written for the compilation, though. Or what mm-hmm. do you got? Um, what do you those, got? And more things change. They were both written for the compilation album. Yeah, yeah no apologies. And this is love. This is life was actually written for the circle. Mm-hmm. But this is love. This is life was rewritten for the compilation. Yeah. Um. But uh, yeah, so that was a great box, and that kind of coincided with the uh, 2011 tour, and kind of back into that greatest tour that I've been. I I went to a lot of shows there, but one important key I want to make note of was the introduction to Phil X in in April 2011. Yeah, um, you know, so obviously you know, Lost Highway era in the circuit, Richie was having problems and stuff, and had to step out a few times, and so. April 2011, for the people that are listening, um, Richie had to step out, and they were just about to embark on a uh, May uh, North American leg. But in April 2011, they had a sh- oh, what New Orleans Jazz Fest or something like that. Yeah. And, and last minute, Richie had his pro- had to go to rehab, and so they found Phil X. And uh, I remember watching the live stream because. This was announced like two weeks prior to the Jazz Fest. And I remember the Jazz Fest show was being live streamed. So I remember a lot of us fans on social media and on the fan club forums were talking about this. Like, who's this Phil X guy? And like, I put like a wall up against him. And I remember, I think they opened up with Raise Your Hand or Blood on Blood. I can't remember. But uh, it was Blood on Blood. But by the end of the show, I was like, this Phil X guy, he is cool. And, like, I am – I was so sad because I knew I wasn't going to get to see Richie for the few shows that I was doing in May 2011. But by the end of that show, I was like, you know what? This show is still going to be as cool. Phil X is, like, phenomenal. It kind of, like, won a lot of fans over, but there was still a lot of that, oh, he's no Richie kind of thing. 
And so he kind of went in with a lot of, I put this in quotations, hatred towards him because he was filling in for Richie. But he really did a phenomenal job on that tour. And then obviously Richie came back in July and, fi and finished the rest of the tour with the band. Um, so let's get into 2013, uh, which was um, the release of What About Now. So prior to that, Richie had released his third solo album, Aftermath of the Lowdown, which is a ph phenomenal, is phenomenal. Uh, solo record. And it, I think this is where a lot of the turmoil with Richie and the band kind of went into because Richie wanted to really fo take a year or two after just finishing up with the Lost Highway tour, the circle, you know, like I said, 2000 to 2011 were the busiest time of the band. And I think Richie just wanted to take a year or two off just to kind of focus on family, work on his personal issues, and also focus on his new solo album. John was going into the studio. What about now is actually Richie's supposed to be a solo album. And then really quickly turned into a band album. Mm -hmm. And um, so I think Richie was kind of caught between two, or uh, he was just caught in between two things. The solo album and the What About Now album. And What About Now is a great album, but it was definitely rushed. No doubt about it. it was, yeah. <laughs> um, I think it was a combo of how their record deal was set up, because if you notice, it was every two years. Have a Nice Day was 05, Lost Highway was 07, Circle was 09, they did the Greatest Hits compilation in 2010, toured 11, 2012, they took a breath for 30 seconds, and then What yeah. About Now came out. Well, and 2012 was a lot of the writing and recording of the album. And they released, I think in 2012, the Inside Out album, which was another live album. Yeah, that was that was something, that's pretty much something that Obi did on his own, really. Yeah. And that then, was of the Lost Highway and Circle Tour live performance. With the What About Now, it's it's because everybody, I think, jumps to 2013. That, that's when Richie left. That, and that album's fantastic. The way they open it, it's like how, how John the, says, um, like how, how they open Because We Can with the course. You know, it's so just like, like how they did You Give Love a Bad Name. They open the song with the course. And, you know, it caught your attention right away. And it had, you know, That's What the Water Made Me was my favorite song on that album. Yeah. It, and a great song on that album, I'm With You. It definitely stood up. And then, you know, we all know what happened, you know, how, how Richie, you know, ended up leaving and everything. And his, because his solo album, Aftermath of the Lowdown, was a masterpiece. Oh, yeah. But you, what about now was just, you know, Shanks was was really good for Have a Nice Day, Lost Highway, and The Circle. But I think the band needed a new producer for What About Now. You know, you can tell that that album was rushed because there's songs like Army of One that is good, yeah. but it's like, could have been better, you know? And I think Couldn't it was just agree. so rushed because this was also the first album, too, where the tour started without the album coming out first, you mm -hmm. know? So the only song, the only way you could hear these songs for the first time was that BBC concert that they did in late yep. 2012. And uh, and uh, I, I saw a few shows before the album came out. And uh, but the the tour was great. And obviously, you know, Richie kind of left. Um, not without getting into the whole Richie thing. Obviously, the second leg of the North American tour, Richie just didn't show up. Um, there's different speculations that we won't get into, but essentially Richie had left the band, band called Philax, and Philax on the drop of a dime flew in the next night and has been with the band ever since. And he has been a saving grace. He has added so much freshness to the band that I think the band needed. Um, and so the band obviously finished the rest of the tour of 2013. And then I, I, I kind of remember, like, in 2014, we were all kind of worried about the direction of the band. Like, what's going to happen to the band now? Because there was that mm -hmm. still holding on to, is Richie coming back for the next album? or what's? And there was, like, all these rumors and stuff, but nobody knew for sure. And then 2015, I remember it was the middle of the summer, and like all of a sudden, like, the band just put out, here's a, here's, the, here's a new song, Saturday Night Gave Me Sunday Morning. 
and we don't run and they're like new albums out in two weeks burning bridges which wasn't actually a new new album it was just a compilation of songs that the band had written over the years but kind of rec- so the band did go back in the studio to record some of these yeah and, and uh and just put it out there and it was just one of those albums that was just to f- fulfill a contract because at that time john was yep. in a turmoil with the band or with the uh record company yep. and uh and pretty much as the cover suggests it's just a brown paper bag look like old vinyl looking thing mm-hmm. no artwork no promo no no and no music videos no, no touring they they did that fun 2015. They did that. I think it was in um, Asia, I think, in um, the end of 2015. They went out for like three weeks. Yep. And so ju- I think it was just kind of get, hey, we're still together. We're still let's we haven't played in two years. Let's get out there and just do a few shows, shows where we never go, on on tour. And then obviously in 2015 we found out that they were going to release this house is not for sale. And we were all kind of wondering, okay, is Richie coming back for this album? And I think John said in an interview somewhere that Richie wasn't coming back. Um, and then so we knew Phil Axe was coming in to record, which is kind of cool because this was the very first Bon Jovi album that you had a new guitar player. Yeah. Um, you know, obviously, like, the thing with Alec, Alec really didn't play on a lot of the albums early on, mm-hmm. but Richie did. And so this is the very, after 30-something years, this is the first album that, we're gonna have a new guitar player yeah. so the band had so much more to prove now you know obviously david bryan stepped up did more which i loved and um the you know the album was more essentially focused on integrity uh confidence um proving that we could still succeed and yeah. still be a great band and it was truly a great album what, what, what did you think of this house is not for sale I was so excited for it. I couldn't wait for it because in between that gap of 2013 to 2016, I was I was a senior in high school in 2013, and I missed the shows at MetLife in the summer of 2013. So I was like, oh, my God, I'm never going to see him again because the whole rumors and everything with, with Richie, is he coming, is he not, is this the end, so on and so forth. I couldn't wait. I re- I played burning bridges around the clock even though i may have not thought it was that great i just needed to hear something from yeah. them and i was so excited for this house is not for sale and i i wish i i agree with you 100 percent about phil ox i'm happy thank god he's here that he you know he was a saving grace i just wish they would have i don't know moved on from shane's producer wise but they would have yeah. got they would have let because if phil X had i think more freedom in his solos, the way the way production is, I, he would, I think he 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 would he would destroy it. He would kill yeah. it because he's, oh. he's 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 not as great as a singer, as Richie. He's good, obviously, but as a guitar player, he's awesome. He's this house is not for sale, dude. This house is not for sale is a great song. The only song I re- I can't get into on this house is not for sale really is, um, the devils in the temple. That's just not yeah. my thing. But all of them, I I. Sure. Love my favorite on it is probably Scars on this guitar. That's a great one. Um, another important part of this house era, though, was also their induction to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. You mentioned that earlier, and, and you can no artist, every artist will say, "Oh, I don't care about the Rock and Roll Hall." But at the end of the day, you do care because it's not it for your success. But event, finally, in 2017, we were able to vote. I remember I voted rigorously. I I voted mm-hmm. every day on the clock. And they're finally inducted in April 2018. And it was so great to see Richie coming back with the band, seeing out, you know, seeing the main five guys, but also seeing Phil X uh, as part of that too. Mm-hmm. And you know, obviously the original lineup got the induction, and then you know Phil X played with the band. So it was cool to you know, you know and as we know now, that was the last time we were going to see Alec. Um, yeah. And but yeah, the the rock call was it was great to finally see them inducted, and then um, to kind of keep things going here, and then so they toured in 2018, and then in 2020 we got the 2020 album, which kind of I think is probably the most heavily socially conscious 
political, it's a political album. Yeah, yeah, you can say what he wants. It's it's you know got yeah. it written all over it. And it, I I love 2020, and it's definitely a stamp in time for that pandemic. And but like songs like American Reckoning, Lower the Flag, I I like those songs, but live, I I, I don't. Th- <laughs> It, it's a mood killer, kind of. You know, because yeah. like you're having a good time, like last year, you're having a good time at the show, and then an hour they start their acoustics and they do American Reckoning and Lower the Flag, and you're you're remembered for all these mass shootings. You're you like feel bad for having a good time and stuff, you know. Yeah. So, but to kind of fast forward to now, so where we are, you know, band is making a new album. Um, and tours happening next year, so things you know. Matt was um, teasing about a runaway trip the other day, so so it, things are moving again in Jovi Lane. I think John has really worked on his voice in the last year because it's no secret he was having trouble he last year. Sounded honestly very good at the drive-in concert in twenty one, where yeah. I was. If for his sake, I'm thinking like you know, COVID was good for them where they they stopped for a year year and a half to like rest and do all that <laughs> stuff and seeing them and i saw them in fort lauderdale last year and um on the tour and it was just everything's tuned down key and i'm like i don't know if that was the smartest you know the best move for them because it's like you, you cannot to say it like this but you can hear him more because yeah. it's not as loud as you know the songs are usually yeah. I, I think COVID really. I, I don't want to get. I don't want to get into this uh, with his yeah. voice. I, I think COVID just kind of really affected his voice, um, and so because this was six months prior to the, the tour, and it, it's happened with other singers too. A age, you know. Yeah. He COVID and stuff, and he might have had a cold too during that tour. You know, like I'm. A, I have a head cold right now. I'm. I'm in my third week of it. So yeah. that tour was only a month long, so that could have really affected that too. But I remember some of the um, crew members, like the, the truck drivers or something, people got COVID. And like yeah. Everett was out for, I think, two shows because of COVID. So who, who knows? Like, you yeah. know, I'm but, not, you know, no one should bash him for it because they're on their 40th year. He doesn't yeah. lip sync. He sings his ass off every night. It's a two and a half hour show. And he's yeah. singing some of the hardest songs out there. Yeah, exactly. And I'm at the point, you know what? We, we know the end is coming. We know the final tour is coming. Maybe next year, maybe in a few years. We know the end is it, for the band tour is coming. Yeah. Let's enjoy it while they're doing it. Exactly. You know? Same for every moment. Yeah. And the thing is, too, is John, they did a private Nashville event last May of 22. Yep. So for the last year, they, he hasn't done any He hasn't done any runaway traps, any public performances, any private and no him to water live stream so you know that he's been working on his voice and now that they're gearing up to do a runaway trip a tour next year i i think and doing a new album i think john has worked on his voice yeah just you know i you know i'm pretty sure all of us would agree for this i i can't imagine this coming album is going to be the last thing the last tour because i think just how from the way he's spoken about the end is that he you know, it seems like it's more going to be like, this is it. This is the end. Like, you know, we're going out this, you know, for this year or whatever. I just hope to God Richie's there <laughs> with yeah. Phil. That doesn't mean Phil is leaves or nothing. Cause the both of them on the stage at the same time would be magical yeah. for more than 20 minutes. <laughs> my prediction, this is just my thoughts. This will conclude the episode here. My thought is we will see the end of world torn if not the next tour the tour after that my personal belief is though with tico going into his 70s yeah. john isn't as excited to go on tour anymore um and what i see is i see a new album the new box set to celebrate 40 years next year is going to be a, a big celebration for 40 years hopefully richie does come back i'd love to see richie and phil mm-hmm. on stage together and make next year just a big celebratory world tour what happens after that, who knows? But if anything, maybe next year would be a great time to say, okay, we've been here for 40 years. This is going to be our last world tour. Doesn't mean it's the end of the band. You know, I could still see them doing residencies. I could still see them do maybe doing another album. Um, 
But if my prediction, I, I think we will see the end of the ban within the next five years. Yeah, I, I yeah, I hate to say it like I agree, but I, you're not wrong. I, I just and it may, may not be one of those traditional. I honestly uh, think they've hinted at it because even the way they toured for this house is not for sale. 2017 was, you know, I think February through the middle of April. 18 was pretty much a late winter to early spring tour. 19 was overseas. This is the same album that he's promoting, obviously. That's how he, if that's how he's got to do it, that's how he's got to do it, obviously. But it's getting there. Yep, exactly. The, the torrent has slowed down. The band, you, you, like you can even tell John, you know, John has pretty much retired. He's living in Miami now, and I think he's just focused on his family, Hampton Water, and you know, and rightfully so. The, the man has earned where he's at right now. Yep. You know, so you know, if the band does announce, hey, next year's gonna be our final tour, I respect it. I'm gonna have a good time next year, and they may not do what other bands are traditionally doing. Saying that's the end of us. We're not doing anything after this. They still may do stuff. They might still release some music here and there, do a residency. But that's what I think is going to happen. I think next year will be the last world tour. After that, I think we'll start seeing some like small tours like we saw last year or residencies. And we'll see. You know, whatever they do, I'm going to be supportive. Exactly. I just, I'm excited for the box set, 40th year. I'm excited for the new record. I can't yeah. wait to see which way he's going to go with it on writing and just can't yeah. wait to see what's next. I do. I, before we, I end this, I want to also say, as much as I loved 2020, and I want the next album not to be as heavily political, socially mm -hmm. conscious. And I love Shanks. I respect Shanks. He was great for Have a Nice Day up into the circle. But we need a new producer. I think What About Now, This House Is Not For Sale were great albums, but could have been better with a different producer. And so I really hope that we get a new producer in the next. Uh, yeah, time. agreed. Even like because with 2020, songs like Limitless and Beautiful Drug are they're great songs. They're upbeat. They're fun. They're anthems, and they're you know they're a great time. And hopefully the next album could be, you know, some of that. I would love to, love, love to see them go back into like the electric ballads, like how they did on. Um, on like Lost Highway a little bit, or or even on Bounce, yeah. and definitely want to just see, you know, you know, he's gonna have I'm sure his handful of his songs, and but you know, hopefully the majority of it is um, all what they've done for the past forty years. Exactly. Anyway, buddy, thank you so much for taking you know pretty much two three hours of your time tonight to kind of talk about. 40, I, I know uh, there was so much more that I know you and I could have talked about. Yeah. You know, there was stuff that I held back on or I kind of moved things forward. I know this could have been like a five-hour chat, so yeah, I appreciate you taking the time to uh, do this with me tonight to do two episodes. So, um, I so thank you for you. having me because I've been following you for for you know a couple of years now. I was I appreciate this. I was looking forward to this all day. I appreciate it, and uh, I know you signed up months and months ago to be on the uh the podcast <laughs> and i'm going down a list so it was great to finally have you to come on so um yeah before i conclude i want to ask you what, what's your favorite era of bon jovi 2000s easily okay but 2000 to from crush until the circle yeah, that's mine too. You know, like I said earlier, it's like every fan's dream. They're, they was always doing something. Yep. You know? They always kept us busy. They always kept us honest. They always. I, I remember even when Lost Highway came out, my dad gave me the CD. Hey, I was like, already? Like, we're, we're doing this again? Like, yeah. I it was just yesterday. Yeah. So, anyway, buddy, thank you thank so you, much man. for coming on. And uh, don't hang up. I'm going to end the recording and we'll uh -huh. say, okay? All right. Thanks, bye.